Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alex Magaisa, and uh, I'm going to be presenting this session with my colleague, uh, Terry Lapp. Um, Hello. I, I'd like to, to welcome you all uh, this session, which is entitled, What is Company Law? Uh, Terry and I uh, both teach uh, here at Kent Law School. Uh, we also co-teach on the company law and capitalism module. So what we are presenting here is just a, a brief snippet really of what company law is to the community, to students, uh, prospective students, and those of you who might have an interest in company law. Uh, Kerry, would you like to say something before we begin? Yes, sure. Um, sorry, Alex, I just realised if, if we click on the top left from beginning button, just so this, we can all see the, the full slide. So, sorry, hello, I'm Kerry Love. Um, as Alex just kindly introduced me, I am um, one of the company law teachers at KLS. I'll be convening next year. Uh, my background is from in practice corporate and commercial law. I'm also one of the ACE coaches at Kent Law School, which is a fantastic initiative where we give some intense uh, coaching, essentially. We don't tell you the answers, but we help you get your, there yourself for students that maybe aren't quite reaching their true potential. And I am director, sorry, deputy director of admissions in the school, so I'm quite heavily involved there. I really look forward to hopefully with many of you joining us um, in the autumn or next year. And I also teach on a few of the other um, stage one modules. So I might see some of you then for introduction to obligations and then taught law in stage two. So I hope you enjoy what Alex and I have put together for you um, today, just to really get you thinking about company law and the commercial world around us, which I think we'll all agree is in quite a, um, an interesting, fascinating, wrong word, probably fascinating, it will be a state of transition with the fallout of the pandemic uh, and the financial hit on many companies. Um, so yeah, enjoy it. And I hope you use the chat function, get heavily involved with us today. Back to you, Alex. Thank you so much, uh, Kelly, for that uh, introduction. So um, one question to kick off our session today. Um, I would like you, uh, you can do so using the chat box, um, just to name any three products or services that you have used today or in the last 24 hours and identify the company that you think either met the product or provide the service. Uh, please use the uh, chat box to give us your views. It might be that you used some cold gate today to brush your teeth and you could tell us <laughs> the company. So. <laughs> you could tell us the company. <laughs> uh, that you think makes it so uh, it, it's not a trick question anything anything really uh, you might actually be using one of the products today you might be using one of the services right now so uh, i'd like just to we want to see a sort of a view that you have in terms of companies and what they do so uh, please oh, do that in your chat box and carrie uh, will look at that and, 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 and uh, give us your view thank you Go ahead, Kerry. We have, some, we have, sorry, Alex, we have some really good responses coming in already. We've got a Nivea shower gel, Zoom, very current, um, Amazon, Evian, Twitter, Uber, Google. Uh, we have another question saying, is the NHS considered a company? An interesting question there. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, very interesting. And, and I'm, I'm very happy to see that people are actually asking such a question. Uh, the only thing that I would probably push back uh, to uh, the people who are chatting and giving us their views is to tell us what the NHS is actually called in full because the answer lies in the name of the NHS. I don't know if anybody would like to do that. And uh, while, while you are searching for the full name of the NHS or trying to tell us what the full name of the NHS is, and then Terry can explain to you what that is, whether it's a company or not. Um, the other thing that we're also trying to get from you is what, what do you like most about companies? 
And secondly, what do you dislike most about companies? So it's really a question you can pick whichever side you want to pick. Uh, tell us what you like about companies. Tell us what you dislike about companies. That will sort of give us- So we-, we... Go ahead, Terry, please. Sorry, I was gonna say we've had a few very on the ball um, participants saying it's the National Health Service. Obviously, you know, we're extremely lucky to have the NHS. Many countries do not have that and have an entirely privatized owned system of healthcare service. So in, in short, no, it's not a company. And we hope that we don't, well, I don't know. Again, it's a very personal position instead, but I quite a socialist in nature on this one feel that the NHS is a fantastic resource that we should retain. And I would hate to see too much being privatized. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Kerry. And uh, I was hoping, I don't know if anybody in the chat box is uh, saying it's the NHS Trust, um, because uh, that will then give us an idea, uh, perhaps a hint as to the kind of uh, uh, structure uh, that establishes the NHS. It's a trust, uh, and the NHS um, the facilities are run in that regard. And uh, as you rightly pointed out, some countries have an entirely privatized uh, health service where private companies provide the services and people have to pay for them and so forth, which is quite different from the way the NHS is run. So therein uh, lies your answer. And I'm happy that Kerry have already pointed out to some of the controversies and debate over the NHS, whether it should continue in the current form as a public service or it should be privatized uh, in, in, you know, in, in which case mm. it would be run by private companies. I don't know if anybody has said anything about what they like most about companies or dislike we, about companies. Shall I, shall I read some out, Alex? We've, we've got do. a lot of good responses here. One, one straight away that I found quite controversial, I'm not sure how much I agree with this statement, but it's a very, very valuable one. I believe I like the company's responsibility towards us, the consumer. They are liable from so many points of view. So I don't know how do you feel about that question, Alex, because I'm not sure companies are liable and responsible, unfortunately. That's a very good, uh, a very interesting response, uh, Kerry. But I think something that will probably become more apparent in our discussion, because remember, one of our sections of this presentation is going to be talking about the responsibility of companies. So maybe we can pack that a little bit and see whether the respondent is going to uh, have a change of opinion or will still be holding on to that opinion that companies are responsible towards us as consumers. Are there any other responses, Kelly? We do. We have, I dislike the regular work timings and how they monotonize products and services. Aha, that's interesting. Some are too profit driven. Aha, interesting. I also see another respondent saying, I like and appreciate their involvement and active role in addressing social issues like DAG with women empowerment through various initiatives. That's an interesting one as well. Uh, and uh, I see another one uh, saying that uh, I dislike the regular work timings and like how they monetize products and services. That's fascinating, fascinating response. I think we Absolutely. should do more of this with our students, Kerry, when we're teaching. You hear what they have to I say, because this do. is fascinating. Um, I absolutely do. And, absolutely. Uh, and just to conclude on the NHS point, a, a, a very valid point, I think, just to raise from one other comment on here saying that the NHS is a government funded body that gives the free healthcare, but it isn't free as obviously it's funded through the payment of our taxes. So yes, you're, you're spot on. That is how it's absolutely. funded. But absolutely, absolutely. It's available to the wider community, but yes, absolutely. That is, so it isn't a complete freebie. Uh, so I just wanted to conclude that in case anybody was misled Excellent. earlier. Thank you so um, much. One other comment. Yep. I dis. Sorry, Alex. Go, I go dislike on, the on. use of harmful. 
harmful ingredients that they use and the mm -hmm. lack of transparency in the use of those ingredients. Again, uh, uh, really good that you're thinking here already about some of the, uh, uh, as well as there are many benefits to a company, there are quite a few negatives. Um, so I don't want to, we don't want, Alex and I don't today want to paint too much of a dire picture about companies. Um, they're very useful for a lot of things, uh, but it's really good that you're thinking of some of those negatives. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kerry. I think you know what's going to happen? If we keep going, we'll probably spend the whole hour talking about this issue, which is absolutely <laughs> fascinating. Yeah. Uh, but we're going to move on to the next slide. So uh, the first thing that we want to do, or maybe the second thing that we want to do after hearing from you, because obviously we want this to be very interactive for you to hear us and for us to hear what you have to say. So thank you so much for that participation. Please keep participating keep chatting, keep giving us your views. Now, there are different types of business organizations. If you want to start a company or start a business, sorry, you can do it as a sole trader. So my name, Alex, and I can decide, I will run my uh, online company and uh, I'll do it as a sole trader. I don't have to register with anybody. I don't have to do any formalities. I just do it as a sole trader. There are a lot of people who do business as sole traders. Maybe those of you who are listening and participating in this, you probably have your own little side business that you're doing. You are acting as a sole trader. That's a form of business. Another type of business is called a partnership. So if Kerry and I want to start a company where we are going to teach people company law, um, sorry, to start a business where we teach people company law, we can do it as a partnership. We share 50-50. And we, what it means is that we share the responsibilities, we share the profit of our business. If we make a lot of money, we share a lot of money. However, if uh, we incur debts or liabilities, then we also have to share uh, those debts or liabilities. The problem with the partnership is that if Alex goes on a frolic of his own and decides to incur liabilities, then Kerry as a partner is still going to be responsible for my liabilities. So that's what makes it uh, rather risky to run a partnership. But, you know, with a partnership, you don't need to do any registration. You can just carry on. And uh, like I say, you share the profits, but you also share the losses of the partnership. And then there's also another type of partnership called the limited liability partnership, but we're not going to talk about that in more detail today because we are more interested in the company and the contrast between what we call the common law partnership that I've just explained and the company, which is often referred to as the limited liability company. So in our example here, we say, imagine Jane, Peter and Sam agree to start an online marketing business. They can run it either as a partnership or they can run it as a company. Uh, we have a small poll for you here, which we'd like you to participate in, and we're going to put up the question, the poll, to tell us what you would prefer. Would you prefer to run your business as a partnership, or would you prefer to run your business as a company? Now, while you're doing your poll, uh, other things that I'd like to mention, when you're forming a company, you have to register it. There is a an entity called the company's registry. You have to go through a process of registration. In the olden days, everything was done physically. You had to do paperwork and so forth. But these days, you can register your company online. And um, one of the things that we'll probably do while we're giving you this session, we're going to find the link to the company's registry so that you can even go there. Or you can do uh, uh, the usual Google and find where the company's registry is. Um, the advantage of having a company, and you're going to see a lot of them in this discussion uh, over a partnership, as I say, is that your liability when you're running a company is limited. Whereas when you're running a partnership, your liability, we say it is joint and several. In other words, the liability that your partner has is also your liability and you pay for the liabilities of uh, other partners in your, in your, in your business. Whereas with a company, liability tends to be limited. But anyway, before we get into much detail, uh, please do participate in this poll. 
uh, let us know what you think about whether you would prefer to run it as a partnership or you would prefer to run it as a company. Maybe your answer will differ towards the end of the uh, session when you have heard a lot more about how a company is run. Okay, uh, so while we do this poll, uh, I think that we are going to get a, a response to that. So maybe carry after about a minute or so, uh, we could have a, a result of the poll uh, to see yeah, how many sure. people. Yeah, and uh, in just the to let you know, Alex. Uh -huh. One participant has, has just popped on the chat and said um, another very interesting comment. The company may take longer to process for registration. So, but be aware, guys, that you can get a company form the same day. It, it's so easy. And, and I, unless the fees have changed, I haven't looked um, very recently. But the last time I looked, I think it was 13, one, three, 13 pounds the registration fee for a company and same day formation. Um, very easy, very, very easy, which has changed over the last century. It wasn't that easy to form them. And just in response to that interesting point. Uh, I'm Absolutely. not sure we have the re result yet of the poll. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Okay, shall I read it out? So the, the poll results, 24% of you thought partnership, 76% would opt for a company. That's very interesting, Kerry. And thank you so much, everyone, for participating in that poll. Uh, let's see if your views will be vindicated uh, or perhaps you are going to change your mind when we start talking about what companies can do. Right. So what I'm going to do here is um, uh, just look at uh, uh, this next slide. What is it that makes a company special? So, one of the most important principles of company law is the principle of separate legal personality. Sometimes it's also called corporate personality. Uh, the company is treated by the law as if it were a person, just like you and I. And it is therefore separate from the people who put money into the company who are called shareholders. So those who invest money in the company and the company are separate persons. They are not considered as the same person. The idea of a company having separate legal personality is something that we call a legal fiction. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that because it's quite fascinating. But just to say the difference between a company and a partnership is that in a partnership, there is no separation between the business and the individuals who are partners. The partners are the business. So everybody is responsible for what goes on in a partnership and everybody is responsible for the liabilities. This is a point that I've made over and over again. And it is an important point because it distinguishes a company from a, a partnership. Now, let me go to the idea of fictions. I love this, you know, I, when I, whenever I'm teaching uh, company law, I like to, to go through the notion of fiction so that people understand. So, a lot of things in our lives are, are fictions. You know, a lot of things that uh, govern us, a lot of things that run our lives, a lot of things that we use are actually fictions. They're not real things, but we have created them to become real. So legal fictions are important and they represent, um, uh, this is something great about human kind. There's a lot of wrong things about us, but one of our greatest qualities, one of our greatest assets <laughs> as human kind is our ability to imagine, our ability to bring to reality things that do not exist in the physical sense. This is one thing that really makes us different, or at least I think it makes us different from other animals, from other creatures. Now, I, I qualified it by saying that's what I think, or at least that's what many people like me think, uh, because we don't want to be too presumptuous, isn't it? Maybe trees have imagination, maybe animals also have imagination, but we humans like to think we are very special, and I'm going to go with that. So the special thing is that we are able to imagine, we are able to bring to reality things that actually don't exist in the physical sense. Now, for us to appreciate the significance of fiction, 
or sometimes called imagined realities in our lives. Let us start with what we call objective realities, because objective realities are the opposite. So excuse me, I'm going to be a bit philosophical here, but it's very important for us to understand the idea of the company by looking at this philosophical approach to companies. So let us look at objective realities. Uh, one of the uh, most important objective realities is something called the force of gravity. You know, we always use this example because that's the example that is used by one of my favorite books that I'm going to share with you in this uh, session, which is called Sapiens, A Brief History of the Humankind. And this is one thing that is so fascinating about what we do here at Penn Law School. We are a law school, but we also look to other disciplines to help us make a better understanding, have a better understanding of the subject that we are studying. So we actually have this book called A Brief History of Humankind because it has some very fascinating nuggets about companies and about the world in which we live. Right. So the force of gravity is an example of an objective reality. It doesn't matter whether we are in India, South Africa, or the United Kingdom, uh, the force of gravity exists everywhere in the world, or at least we believe that it exists everywhere in the world. It doesn't matter whether you believe in it, the force of gravity still exists independent of your imagination. So you don't have to believe in the force of gravity for it to exist. It just exists whether or not you like it. So that is an objective reality. An objective reality is something that is independent of our imagination. Now, you cannot say the same thing about things like money, religion, law, morality, constitutions, and a lot of other things. I've left a lot of other things because I want you to think about them. That's why the question at the end there says, can you think of any other imagined realities, any other fictions that you know which are important in our lives? Now, just to go a little bit more, these products of the imagination, uh, they survive because we believe in them. You know, if we didn't believe in the pound sterling, the moment we stop believing in it, then it ceases to exist as money. You know, there are many countries which have had money, currency, but it has completely, you know, gone to waste because people no longer believe in it. We talk about hyperinflation. Those of you who have studied history, I'm sure you would know what happened in the Bible Republic, what happened in many other countries um, where currencies have effectively become extinct. Uh, because people stopped believing in the value of money. The reason why the US dollar is the most important, perhaps most valuable currency in the world is because many people around the world believe in, they believe in the power of the US dollar. But the moment that people stop believing in it, then it will cease to be, uh, 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 you know, to exist. The same thing with the religion. Now, that's a little bit controversial, so I'll just think that a little bit like that. Again, you know, we believe in certain things because we believe in them. Law is another one. We have to construct it to say that we have a constitution. It's something, it doesn't exist naturally. We have to create it and we have to believe in it. Things like morality, you know, things that were considered immoral in the 19th century uh, are very much moral and very much acceptable in the 21st century. So morality is not an objective reality. It is something that people believe in depending on how it is constructed. It is a product of our imagination. Now, whereas an objective reality exists independent of imagination, an imagined reality or a fiction is dependent on our imagination. Now that's where the company comes in. Remember we say a company is a person. Now you and I know that a company is not a real person, but we have imagined that a company is a person. And we have decided to say that a company is a person. As long as we all believe that a company is a person, then it's going to survive. But the moment we stop believing in the company being a person, then it will cease to be a person. So that's where the idea, the legal fiction of corporate personality comes in. This is what makes a distinction between a partnership where we don't believe that it is a person and a company where we have collectively imagined and believed that it is a company. 
So there we go. I hope I haven't confused you too much, but I'd love to hear from you. You can use the chat box to think about other things in your life that you consider to be fiction, to be imagined reality, to be products of the imagination. I don't know if we have made any answers clearly yet. Uh, is anybody okay, we do. Yep. Yeah, we, we have one. Yeah, that, that there must be day and night. Aha, uh -huh. that's interesting. That's interesting. I don't know. What do you think, Kerry? Do you think that is a... That is well, a, it, it, a... Got, it, it got me thinking, actually, because especially, um, I, I don't mean to go off here, but I was lucky enough to go to Reykjavik in, in Iceland pre-pandemic. And obviously they have certain months of the year where they have 24 hours of daylight and have no night time, uh, <laughs> so to speak. So yeah, a very valid, a very valid point there. Another question we have, um, could spirituality and meditation be considered imagined? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think in the affirmative there, yeah, as you say, all religion is something that we we choose to believe in that faith. Um, many of the time, because we see evidence to make us believe in that, but it's something that we choose to believe in. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's another one. Who decided to call a mother mum? Absolutely, absolutely. It, it's something that we're tuned to believe, isn't it? Well, that's fascinating, Kerry, because it's, it's leading us into some very interesting territory here. And, and unfortunately, we're not dealing with gender issues today. But you could also bring it in because I think that's where this might be leading to. So that's another fascinating way of looking at it. Uh, that, would, that would be a great session of its own, you know. Uh, but unfortunately, it's really about that signal companies. Yes. I, I was going to put out there as well to the participants, I'm not sure they would have come across the terminology before, but obviously a big legal fiction that you will all become accustomed to is this saying of the hypothetical reasonable man, reasonable person in law. And, and we are meant to judge another person's behaviour to see if that falls above or below or in line with that social constructed person in law. We do a lot of that. You know, you know, Kerry, uh, you just got me thinking there. And I think that for the benefit of our, uh, our listeners, maybe you should say a little bit more about the reasonable person or the reasonable man, because that's a fantastic legal fiction, I think, which explains it even better than the example that I've given here. Maybe you can do it from a position of tort law, I don't know, or criminal law. Yeah, um, so tort law, for example, which you would do in stage two, it's a second year module, personal injury, tort laws, um, looking at the law of accidents. So part of going through the law of negligence, after you establish whether or not somebody owes you a duty of care, which is if essentially they're in a relationship of proximity to you, so employer, employee, a clear duty of care is owed, a road user, clear duty of care is owed to other vehicles on the road. But then you look at whether or not somebody has breached that duty of care to you. And in looking at um, the test for breach, you see what the reasonable person would have done. So it could be, would they have slowed down at the junction or would they have um, explained something to you in the help in the workplace about health and safety a little bit better. But it's really to sit yourself in what the average person on the street essentially would have done to see whether the defendant's conduct is up to scratch. I, I hope that helps to explain this a little bit, but you will read a lot of case law uh, that says, well, the reasonable man, which gets me because it says man, it should be person, <laughs> uh, but there you go. But there's a, there's a lot of that you, that you need to get used to. And you, it, it's essentially just casting um, over objective opinion collectively in society, whether people think that that conduct was okay or not. Exactly. So I hope that was helpful. Thank you so much, Kerry. Yeah, so the idea of the reasonable man is itself a fiction because the reasonable man doesn't exist. But the judge is going to say the reasonable man, or to be correct, 
a reasonable person would have done A, B, C, D, but you didn't behave like the reasonable person. But actually, the reasonable person is very difficult to pin down. It, it depends on who is, is deciding what that reasonable person is. So that's a fantastic example of a fiction. Another fiction that you might also uh, think about, which you don't realize, is the nation state. You know, take, for example, our country here where we are, Great Britain, and then we also have nations. We then have England, we have Scotland, we have Wales, we have Northern Ireland. Uh, how, how does it work? At what point, uh, uh, when you go to the Olympics, you go to the Olympics as part of Great Britain. When we go for football, we go for football as either England or Scotland or Wales or Northern Ireland. But these are all fictions. These are all imagined realities that we have created and we believe in, right? That's why sometimes new countries are born. Uh, a long time ago, well, 10 years ago, there was a country called Sudan. I don't know if you've heard of it in Africa. But now there is a country called Sudan and South Sudan. Uh, where did South Sudan come from? Again, it's a construction. It's an imagined reality. It's a fiction. So a company is a legal fiction. A company is a legal person. We call it a fiction because we regard it as a person. The only problem with a company, of course, that is it cannot do certain things. It requires individuals to act on its behalf. And those individuals are called directors of the company or managers of the company. And in company law, one of the things that we study is how directors of the company are required or expected to run the affairs of the company. Directors of companies have duties that are imposed by law, like they have to act with reasonable care, skill and diligence, they must promote the success of the company. You know, they must do a lot of other things. There are many duties, and that's one of the fascinating uh, parts of company law. So please keep thinking. I know that we're hitting you with so many new things today, but keep thinking about imagined realities or fictions that you come across in your daily life. Uh, now, I want to move on to the other principle which is important in company law. So far, we've been talking about corporate personality or separate legal personality which we have called a legal fiction, which is very important to the idea of the company. The other legal fiction is called limited liability. So the principle of limited liability. This is really important. Uh, you are often going to hear the company referred to as a limited liability company. Now, one question that I might ask you is, what do you think limited liability means in the context of a company and why does it matter? On reflection, it's a very big question. You might not be able to answer all of it as we speak, but I want you to think about it. Uh, so what limited liability means, together with separate legal personality, these are the principles that give the company very unique qualities that make it a very attractive business form. So the 76% of you who chose a company, uh, you will probably be persuaded uh, to stick with your opinion because of these two important principles of company law, separate legal personality and limited liability. Those of you who chose a company, or sorry, a partnership, maybe you might reconsider after hearing the importance of the principle of separate legal personality, that a company is separate from the shareholders who put money in the company, and that the shareholders who put money into the company their liability is limited uh, to the extent of their investment in the company. Now, it's very easy for people when they hear limited liability company to think the company's liability is limited. No, that's a big misleading. Uh, what it actually means is that the liability of shareholders in the company is limited. Let me give you an example just to make things very clear. If a person buys shares in a company, we call them a shareholder. So let us assume that he or she buys shares in the company which are worth 10,000 pounds. And when you subscribe to shares, you can pay for them now, or you can pay for some of them later. So let's say that the person has paid 7,500 pounds worth of shares. He has taken 10,000 pounds worth, but he has only paid 7,500. So there's a balance of 2,500 that he has to pay to the company. 
Now, if for whatever reason, the company goes bust, goes bankrupt, and at the time of its bankruptcy, it has debts which are 5,000 pounds, liabilities which are worth 5,000 pounds. The shareholder is only required to pay the balance of the share that he hasn't paid for. That's the 2,500 pounds that was outstanding. Now, this will reduce the company's debt or liability to 2,500 pounds. Now, who pays for that? Should the shareholder pay for that? Now, according to the principle of limited liability, he doesn't have to pay for that extra 2,500 because he has already paid for the shares that he bought, which were worth 10,000 pounds. He is not responsible for that. So that is the principle of limited liability. Now, the difference, if this was a partnership, this shareholder would have to pay the whole 5,000 pounds, including the shares that the amount that was not part of his shareholding. So that is the difference really between being a shareholder in a company and being a partner in a partnership. When you are a partner in a partnership, there is no limitation of liability. But when you are a shareholder in a company, your liability is limited. Now, you can see why it's so attractive to be a shareholder rather than to be a partner in a partnership. The genius of the principle of limited liability is that it protects the shareholder from assuming full liability for the company's liabilities. Compare, like I said, with the common law partnership, where all partners are liable jointly and severally for the debt of the partnership. Now, uh, these two principles, separate legal personality, are so important uh, because, number one, they May they mean that the shareholders are separate from the company, and they also mean that the shareholders are not liable for everything that the company owes. They are only liable for what they have subscribed to as shareholders of the company. Now, these principles became very important, were introduced in the 19th century, and they became the drivers, and the company was at the heart of the Industrial Revolution, the capitalist driven. Industrial Revolution. What they did was they encouraged entrepreneurship because they lowered the individual risk that came with the partnership model. If you were a partner, you would be very reluctant to engage in risky business activities because you would end up having to pay large amounts of money in case something went wrong. But if you were a shareholder of a company, then your risk was limited. They also allowed strangers to come together and cooperate, pulling their resources together, which wasn't possible in a partnership model. When you were in a partnership, I would need to work with Kerry because I know Kerry, I like Kerry, I trust her, so we can do a partnership together. But you, if I didn't know Kerry, I would be very reluctant to get into business with her because I cannot trust her. So partnerships are based on trust. Whereas in companies, you can have individuals from the United States of America, from Canada, from Australia, from Austria, from South Africa, from Zimbabwe, from anywhere in the world, they can put their money in the company. They don't need to know each other. Their job is just to invest their money in the company and you know, trust that the directors of the company are going to run the business in a way that will bring them profit. So that's great because it brings a lot of money together to engage in projects that would not be possible in a partnership model. There is also something called perpetual succession. A company has that quality. It doesn't depend on individuals. The partnership between Kerry and I depends on us as individuals. If one of us leaves, the partnership dies. But in a company, you don't have to know each other. You don't have to like each other. Uh, the company will proceed. Remember, we say it's a separate legal person. So it can proceed. We can form the company today, decide to sell our shares to complete strangers after two years, the company will carry on doing business. It doesn't depend on us. So that's an advantage. That's why you find companies which were established in the 18th century, companies that were established sorry, 19th century, in the 20th century, they are still going on, uh, regardless of whether or not the founder is still there. Uh, so you can also form large corporate groups, because remember a company is a person. So the company can also invest in other companies 
And that's when they form multinational companies, you know, companies like BP, you know, British Petroleum, you know, companies like, you know, Virgin, uh, companies, you know, huge companies in the world. Uh, they are formed on the basis that companies are persons which can invest in other persons and they also benefit from the idea of limited liability. So these twin fictions that we humans imagined and believed in are very important in driving the industrial economy, in driving the capitalist economies which have been so dominant over the past two centuries. So there we go. The company is a really important business model. However, however, the company, for all the benefits, all the beauty of companies, there are some troubles with the company. There are some challenges with the company. And now I'm going to hand over the baton to Perry, who is going to tell us about the less palatable elements of the company. And I'm going to start with uh, this slide. I don't know if you can see this slide. Go ahead, Perry. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I apologise in advance if you find any of these images distressing. Some of them aren't very pleasant. But as Alex just said, what I want to introduce to you now, which I think leads in very well to one of the comments on the chat earlier saying, I like how companies are accountable. Um, I just want to show you the rather negative side of that connotation and show you how unfortunately there seems to be a lack of accountability in a lot of instances. I just wonder if any of you recognize what I'll be talking about through any of these photos. Um, if you just want to pop it on the chat, if any of them seem familiar to you, but in the meantime, I, I think I'll get going with the most recent awful corporate disaster in, in the bottom left picture that bar means if you want to note what you think the other pictures are referencing to by all means do so uh, the bottom left the awful awful tragedy that was Gwenfell Tower so very recent in 2017 72 people lost their lives a further 70 were injured some of them severely um, burned and injured over 200 people luckily managed to escape, but absolutely lost everything. They lost their homes. You may have been following this loosely in the media, on the news. Indeed, part of what it takes to be a commercial company lawyer is just to keep abreast of what's going on out there in the law. And if you have, you will have seen that there was a, a big public inquiry, which the results of that were published last year. Um, part of the problem with the fire um, getting so out of control, it was claimed that cladding that was used on the outside of the building acted as an accelerant um, to the fire, unfortunately, which, which helped it to spread. We've then seen calls which I find abhorrent that apparently the London Fire Brigade maybe mismanaged it on the day uh, which caused uh, further loss of life and damage but the the problem being and that I want to get um, to the forefront for you today is that nobody's really stood up and gone okay I think we used the material that wasn't safe for use on that type of building um, because laws have changed Again, it's been on news locally and where I live, about 10 miles down the road, uh, there's this beauty, it's called St Mary's Island, there's lots of yachts and boats and beautiful seafront apartments that are very new, but they're now saying that all of those apartments, the cladding on them is the same cladding that was unfortunately installed on Grenfell Tower and it must be changed. But the government has imposed this very peculiar law that they will only give an injection fund to cover that um, for tower blocks, essentially. So these people, um, the quotes are around 12,000 uh, for their apartments to have the cladding changed. Some of them don't have the money to do that. So they're currently living not only in an unsafe building, but also now with a building that they won't be able to sell because who's going to buy that? You've lost all of your value and the government aren't paying for that, which is awful. Um, 
to add to the Guanfell inquiries that are still very much going on, um, two days ago on the 13th of July, there was a further inquiry which is ongoing. So have a look at this. It's very much in the news this week that they are now saying that it was gas contractors in the building that were reinstalling certain pipework that was defective and they left too many holes. They didn't fill the gaps essentially. And this allowed the fumes and the smoke to absolutely accelerate up through the building. So just a really awful one. And I'm sorry to talk about it. I know it's a horrible topic to bring to your attention, but just to show you that we are now four years on from that disaster uh, and we're still trying to work out who should, who could be accountable. In my mind, but I might be a bit too opinionated about it, if, if that product which shouldn't have been used in a building like that should be the people that commissioned its use, surely, and the, and the people that installed it that should be having some accountability there, but it doesn't seem to be happening as yet. Um, so just to move to the other photos, I've had a couple of comments coming in here. So we've got oil and gas disasters and, and well done to you um, indeed they these are what the other pictures um, capture so in your top left corner you have the really unfortunate the BP um, explosion which happened quite a while ago now over a decade ago otherwise known as the deep water horizon it was an oil rig unfortunately um, loss of life. Again, 11 workers sadly lost their life there. An absolutely huge, huge oil spill that many wildlife will never come back from. 130 million gallons of oil released into the ocean and it took over two months to start to be able to capture and clean up that oil. The reason for this, the reason this happened Again, it seemed to go down to a lack of maintenance on the rig and making sure that everything was doing as it should be. Uh, the major shareholder involved here that was a 40% majority shareholder of the company involved paid out a record number of damages, some 450 million US dollars um, out. But is that enough? That's the question that I would pose to you. Is it enough? Can money... And we've seen this many a time in, in lesser oil spillages. Shell and BP have been under the limelight a few times um, for the disaster that they caused to the environment, which is a huge pressing issue. The damage to our ocean is, is frightening for our future uh, generations. And often the company, it seems, will take the fine rather than to change their internal practices which would stop this happening again. So I've just had a question come through on the chat and it says, if people who installed it have advised that the product not been the right one for the building and those who ordered it said to use it, will that excuse them? No, it shouldn't do, um, but a very good question and quite analogous to what happened to um, with the Volkswagen scandal and the, the fuel emissions and also you had another case with motors, BP General Motors, where they fitted the fuel tank in a slightly different place because it saved money. And they ended up paying out money uh, as compensation because the profit was higher. It's absolutely ludicrous. Um, and the middle image uh, and the bottom right image is making reference unfortunately, to the Bolpol disaster, which was almost 40 years ago now, um, happened a very, very, very sad situation of a huge gas leak um, at a plant in India, which, well, it's still uh, debated the true death toll there um, from a couple of thousand to perhaps 10,000 um, people that died very sadly within a couple of weeks of being exposed to the very toxic um, gases, thousands, absolutely thousands of people, it's estimated at something at half a million people were left with life changing um, disabilities as a result to exposure. Still here again, very sadly, 
not all people have received the compensation that they should have. And that figure is astounding into hundreds of thousands of people that have not been compensated. Again, the reason for this was a lack of maintenance going on at the plant. Uh, he said that the lack of maintenance caused a backflow of water, which mixed with the gas caused the temperature to get too much and that resulted in the explosion. So just to show you some of the negative sides that we've seen, okay, limited liability is fantastic for some, if you're the business owner and the shareholder, but it also does mean that there's a big problem with accountability. And that's something that we very much look at in the module as to whether we need to somehow make shareholders more active and accountable um, within the company. So just to follow on, sorry, I'm doing the negative side of things here a bit, but it's really just to get you to think about the consequence of separate personality and limited liability. So a few more problems to note to you to just to get you to think about that you might not have before. I'm conscious of the time being 10 to now, so I might just gloss over some a bit more than what I plan to. So externalization of risk. We've already mentioned, well, Alex has mentioned to you that the shareholder's risk is capped to the value of its shareholding. So if I invest 100 pounds into a company, but it owes a debt of 50,000 pounds, I will never be asked to put in more than my original 100 pounds. So other people take the hit of the loss, if you like. So a creditor, this might be a terminology that's new to you. This is anybody that's owed money by a company. So it could be that you've done work uh, or you've provided a product to a company and you're owed money. Um, so creditors are further subdivided into do, two different camps. You can be a secured creditor or an unsecured creditor. Um, we touch upon this in the module, but not too much in depth. It's something that you become familiar with, but you look at more at law school and LPC and bar courses. But if you're a secured creditor, it means that you protect your interest in the equivalent of a mortgage you'd have on your house, but there are company law mortgages and they're called debentures and charges. And that would give you some protection and some claim over the assets of a company or the stock of a company if you go for a floating charge instead. But it's just to show you that if you're not careful, so if you're an unsecured creditor, so if you do work for a business for a month, but you've got 10 people working on that job and each day that the wage bill is a couple of thousand pounds, you can soon see after a month that you, you might have a big amount of money being owed to you as a company of £100,000. If the company suddenly falls into a really dire straits financially, the creditor, but not being secured, would take the hit for that. Um, the same with employees, being, and again, the fallout of COVID and redundancies, absolutely awful, um, what the future holds for some corporations. I've touched upon, I think, in the previous slide, the, the problem with the fallout for the community and the environment of things when things go wrong and they go very badly wrong, who it is that has to suffer the blow for that. So corporate greed, just one I'll touch on before I scan through the others, irresponsibility. So we um, study capitalism as, as a really interesting topic that the students often love uh, when they do this module at Kent Law School. So capitalism, if it isn't familiar to you, it's about that concept that you always want to accumulate, you're always making money. Um, and in, in turn to do that, you need to at times often innovate. So I don't know if any of you just quickly pop it on the chat because it goes in with this section quite well. Can you think in your lifetime, I can think of many in mine, things that have replaced something because a better version came out uh, and that's all links into capitalism and companies overtaking each other. And one of you earlier mentioned a monopoly. Um, so it's getting that market share. So just to start you off down on university campus, when hopefully you'll be there, which won't be long, you have a fantastic co-op supermarket. The last two years, we replaced many of the till points to self-serve. That is known in the capitalist world as creative destruction. We keep striving to make more money, make things simpler. I'm not sure sometimes they self-serve uh, tills are simpler, but it's always the next step, the next innovation. Oh, some really good um, 
comments there, phones, laptops, games, cars, all really good ideas. I was thinking as well, um, when I was growing up, it was cassette tapes, videotapes. We went from that to um, yeah. CD, DVDs. Mm -hmm. Now it's a stream service, isn't it, Alex? Yeah, absolutely. How things have changed. Absolutely, yes. Um, so I'm just really mindful of the time. So sorry, yeah. I'm sort of you, you, you know, through you, these. You, you, you know what, Kerry? Uh, I know that we are, we are running short of time, but I just wanted we to are. squeeze this one in. I wanted to squeeze this one in because I think it's really absolutely uh, fascinating because we were talking about the NHS earlier. So today I was listening to radio. Well, I, I listen to radio for I'm very dull. <laughs> um, but I was listening to I was listening to, to the news this morning when I was driving, and uh, there was a story there about a pharmaceutical company uh, or pharmaceutical companies which were selling uh, a certain drug to the NHS for 77p uh, per drug, uh, say 10 years ago. And, and, and more recently, that same drug was now costing 88 pounds. It's a 10,000% oh. rise in that particular drug. And the reason is because that company wow. decided to buy out all the competition, and then it had a monopoly in providing this drug. So you can imagine the amount of money that taxpayers, with ultimately taxpayers, are the ones who fund the NHS. They have been paying to this particular group of companies which is simply monopolizing the market. They have been fined $250 million uh, pounds, I think, but I don't even think it's enough to compensate for the losses that have taken place. So that is the notion of corporate greed. But what was fascinating was that they were asked the question, so who is going to be responsible? And the person said, well, the companies are going to be responsible. And they said, what about the directors of the company? They said, oh, we cannot do anything about directors because they are separate from the company, remember? The point about separate yeah. legal responsibility. So there you go. I just had to squeeze that in, Terry. Sorry. No, no, you no, you carry on, Alex. It's, it's a really good point to mention. And and I'll just finish up, I think, Alex, on this slide, and then we can go to your next one, just to say under the heading of um, avoidance of liability, so tort victims, um, a big, a big issue that we look at in the module again. Uh, we look at this very famous case of Adams and Cape, um, where these poor employees, um, many of them lost their lives or had uh, a very life limited illness through exposure to asbestos of mesothelioma. And we had a huge problem there with um, uh, putting liability on the company, even though it was obvious uh, that, been, that they, they had acquired it in their job as miners. So it, it's a real big issue. And, there have been some positive moves. We have seen more recent cases where the courts have been able to find in tort law, a completely different area outside of law, uh, to find some accountability for them. But it, it's a huge, huge is issue, isn't it, Alex? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I don't um, know if I, you want to go on to the last slide. Sure, uh, I'll, I'll do that, I'll do that, Kerry. Uh, thank you so much for, for that uh, very clear articulation. Uh, I see some on the chat. Uh, somebody is saying, why do we only have one hour? Uh, sorry to ask. You know what, I think you must be doing a fantastic job. <laughs> I think I think that some people are enjoying the session. Yeah, it's uh, good to know, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it's only, it's only an hour. Maybe we might go over a little bit uh, because we are also enjoying it. Um, but the point I wanted to make, uh, the last slide that we have is, and we have a poll for you. Uh, who should companies Save. So there are two approaches that we study in company law. One approach is that companies should be run only for shareholders because the shareholders are the people who invest money in the company. So profit maximization should go to the shareholders. So according to this view, which is very capitalist, of course, it is that those who put money in the company are the only persons for whom the company should be run. A different view is that no, shareholders are not the only persons who are important in the company. There are also other stakeholders who must also be served by the company. They include employees of the company, creditors of the company, the community, the environment, you know, and various other you know, sort of stakeholders who also have interest in how the company is working. So according to this view, 
Yes, it's okay to look at the shareholders because they put money in the company, but you must also not forget that employees invest labor in the company, and therefore their investment should not be subordinated to the investment of shareholders who are putting money in the company. So those are the two sort of distinct uh, approaches to company law. One is referred to as the shareholder-oriented approach to company law or corporate governance, and another one is called the stakeholder approach to corporate governance. The view being that the stakeholder approach is more amenable to better responsibility on the part of companies. Now, the exercise that I have for you is, or we have for you is, which approach do you favor? Do you favor that the company should only serve shareholders because they are the people who put money in the company, so they should be served? Or do you think that it should be stakeholders? We'd like to hear your views on this because we are now getting to the end of our session. Uh, what do you think? What's your, what's your view on this? Uh, I don't know if uh, we can have results of the poll. Uh, the, the trouble that we have is we are running short of time. Um, so we'd like to conclude. Right, so we have 35% uh, of the people saying only the shareholders should be the ones who are served by the company, because I suppose they're the ones who put money in the company. Please feel free to put your reasons in the chat box if you'd like to, would like to read them out. Uh, then we have 65% who think the company should be run more on a stakeholder basis, that the stakeholder approach should be promoted. Again, please feel free to share your views uh, in the chat box and uh, we, can, we can read them out. Uh, Alex, we have one here. Um, sure. Companies should, companies should serve the shareholders because the shareholders put the money and resources towards the formation of that company. That's not to say stakeholders are not important. Uh -huh. That's very interesting. So that's a very shareholder oriented approach uh, to the running of companies. I don't know if there's anybody who has a different view. Uh, without stakeholders, the company fails, no fails. matter how much the shareholder has invested. So that's a, a different view on this matter. Please keep them coming. Uh, please keep them coming. Uh, as we get to the conclusion of our session, uh, Kerry is going to keep on the lookout in the chat box and we'll read out some of your responses while I finish sort of conclude the whole thing. So what we have seen is that the company is an important and popular form of business. Uh, the twin protections offered by those legal fictions, separate legal personality and limited liability, give it a competitive advantage over the partnership as a business model. The corporate form is a creature of the imagination, which is bad by law and exists to the extent that it is believed. The law, judges, capitalists, political actors, they all work very hard to protect the corporate form from erosion. Uh, one topic that we would have loved to cover, but we don't have time, is something that is so fascinating called lifting the corporate veil. So these are the few occasions when sometimes the legal personality of the company is ignored, when the legal fiction is put aside so that the shareholders of the company are held responsible for the wrongs that are done by the company. Uh, although it is regarded as one of the greatest inventions of humankind, the company has also caused some great harm and suffering to individuals, society, and the environment, which we have articulated in this session. Therefore, there are calls for more regulation of companies and the need to promote a more stakeholder approach to corporate governance. So there we are. I hope that you have enjoyed this session. Uh, I would have loved us to have more time and maybe one day we'll do another session like this, Kerry. Uh, would you like to say Absolutely. some concluding words, uh, Kerry? Maybe reading from what uh, the participants have been saying as we yeah, conclude the session. There's one more um, comment that's gone up that I think is how I feel a lot of the time. They're saying, it's almost like they're battling with themselves here. The company belongs to the shareholder, but their idea and concept is brought for use by the public. They should be protected and the company should serve them. But in the same time, the company was incorporated to serve the public. 
So I, I think that participant there is kind of confused and, and seeing both sides of the coin, which I think is a very, very common view to hold that if you invest your money, surely you shouldn't invest above and beyond and there should be unlimited liability. Otherwise, we may as well revert back to partnership business model. And we saw the fallout of that and we saw the innovation and the growth of the economy by using the twin protections in the corporation. But at the same time, we must, the stakeholders, i.e. all of the people affected within the, the working of a company. Yeah. There's a last one there, uh, Terry, which I think is a fantastic comment that by one of the participants. Companies should save stakeholders because they not only would not be successful without them, but they should also be aware of their impact on society as it would allow them to remain competitive. I think on that note, we can come to a conclusion, Kerry. This has been fascinating. Thank you so much to everybody who joined us. Uh, yes, I thank hope that you. We can, I hope we can do this another time, but uh, I've certainly enjoyed it very much. Thank you. And we hope to see many of you uh, on campus at some point in the future. Take care, everybody. Absolutely. Thank you.